I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade. Cue the music. This drunken little German munch. Mm-hmm. He's intoxicated with himself. Sober him. Lighten up, Francis. <laughs> I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade, the weekly theological podcast where we sit down at the kitchen table, grab ourselves an ice-cold beer, and we talk about theology. Lutheran Lemonade, to gladden the heart of man. Where can you find Lutheran Lemonade? Well, um, in a traditional schedule, when the world's not crazy, it... um, Mid to late evening on Thursday evenings at soundcloud.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade. And then, of course, on Friday evenings on YouTube at 1517 Films. Just look for the 1517 in that circle with the word films underneath. You got me. Uh, you can find the video. Uh, in a perfect world, uh, that that would be the case. Uh, but the world is crazy. My schedule is crazy. Uh, I'm not just sitting at my kitchen table anymore. I'm sitting at my desk. <laughs> So I've got another monitor off to the side there, tucked away, so that my workspace uh, doesn't clutter up the whole thing. Yep, uh, life is good. So uh, we've got a cold beer, we're going to talk about theology, and uh, I want to talk about... I don't know what's the best way to say it. I don't don't want to steal a really awesome catchphrase from a different podcast, but um, we're going to talk about how the Word of the Lord endures forever and we're going to talk about what we're seeing these days pouring out of God's church and how for the time being that's a blessing but let's pay attention to it so it doesn't become a curse what on earth am I talking about well I don't know maybe what denomination you're listening from what tradition or or background or Christian heritage you might be listening from but in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and some subsidiaries, I should say, like the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod or the AALC. Um, I'm seeing a lot of really good stuff coming out. Pastors who have either admitted they don't know the first thing about technology and called upon their youth, uh, or the youth who have stepped up and said, hey, pastor, we got this, or even some pastors who are already ahead of the curve on this one, and they are streaming some amazing things. So a lot of us... um, a lot of us are unfortunate. A lot of us can't go to church. A lot of us, turns out, even myself, I can't receive the sacrament of the altar for the time being. But what I'm seeing coming from the Lutheran church, I'm seeing things like matins and vespers and responsive prayer one and two and, and compline or morning prayer and evening prayer. I'm seeing divine services being streamed. I'm seeing sermons being uploaded. I'm seeing a bunch of Lenten devotions being uploaded. So in the midst of what seems like a barren wasteland, where we can't gather together as God's people to hear his word and to receive his sacraments, while that might seem barren, what I'm seeing, at least from the Lutheran church, is a a lavish washing uh, that's uh, just a, a the the rain clouds have gathered and are just raining down God's word, because there are lots of things Jesus promises and lots of things Jesus gives. Um, and if you follow my Lenten devotion series, uh, Faith of Our Fathers, we're going through the Gospel of Mark. You've recently heard Jesus say, "Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away." So. While we might be, well, it's, a, it's Lent, it's an objective way to look at it. Well, we might be fasting from the Lord's Supper, forcibly so, and we can talk about that. Is this a forced fast? Um, we are, ooh, that beer is so good. <laughs> it tastes good even after a long day of work from home. Um, we can talk about that a little bit. Where? What were we talking about? Oh my gosh, I lost my place. We were talking about... Ah, yes, Uh, the word of the Lord, Uh, Oh, and fasting, okay, so we're in Lent, so it's kind of like, I've heard some people say, oh, maybe this is Mother Earth, you know, sending us to our room for the way we've been behaving. There's a word 
anthropomorphiz anthropomorphizing is that the word i'm looking for i i don't want to anthropomorphize god per se but it, look it, it we do need to have this conversation because there are charismatic preachers who are saying this isn't god god's not doing this god would never send a play really 10 bucks says a quick read through the book of Exodus will change your mind on that one. God will never send a plague. Um, yeah, God uh, God does. Uh, I mean, even in, in beautiful gospel moments, we catch a glimpse of things that could hurt us. I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. If a, if a branch is blooming, well, even that branch is going to get pruned back so that it can produce more fruit. But as far as sin goes yeah this coronavirus is 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 god's condemnation to us as humankind for our sin now uh if we would uh repent of our sins and uh humble ourselves before the lord and re return to him with prayer and fasting and and with sincere repentance turning from our transgressions to the lord in all humility, not boldly declaring, ah, uh, I declare the coronavirus, well, this, that, or th that's not it. We're talking about humbling yourself. We're talking about ashes and sackcloth. We're talking about tears streaming. We're talking about gut-wrenching repentance. We're talking about confession, Psalm 51 style confession. Not only, Lord, have I done this thing, but I am sinful even from birth. My very nature is corrupted. And then we pray, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. This is, this is a good prayer. This is so... We are, as Christians, we're called to pray right now. We're being forced to fast. For, for those of us who understand what the sacrament of the altar is, what it gives, who it is, and the benefits of the sacrament, we're being forced, many of us, to fast from this. This has been taken away from us. We can't have it right now. But the Lord does not abandon his people. The Lord is pouring out his word. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about live streaming. We're talking about what the, the, the church of the 21st century. We're talking about, well, like I mentioned before, the, the Lutherans, we're waking up. We, we've been, that was a, that was a big P. Um, so much for pop filters working. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting too tall above the pop filter. That's why I did that. Okay. Lutherans, we've, we've been asleep. And I think I have every right to say this because I'm I'm what some people will call a new Lutheran, a new Lutheran. I've been confessionally Lutheran for thirteen something years like that now, but I wasn't. I was a charismatic. I was a fundagella Baptocostalist, um, and I worshipped. My idol of choice was myself and my emotions, uh, as most people are. And now um, I understand that it's not about me. It's not about what I feel. It's about what God's word promises and, and faith clinging to that promise. You hear me say that a lot lately. Faith clings to the promise. And I see inside the Lutheran church the litany, matins, morning prayer, vespers, evening prayer, compline, responsive prayer one and two, the daily prayer offices, the heaven forbid, should, I, should a Lutheran call them the liturgy of the hours? And I'm seeing this all over Facebook, all over YouTube. Pastors praying morning prayer, holding daily prayer offices online, streaming. If you want really good daily content, then you need to get onto Facebook. You can find me uh, on facebook.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade. Uh, but you also need to look up Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. On, on Facebook. Now, they always stream their morning chapel at 9 a.m. Something, something time. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, well, now, it's a little bit different because, well, th there's no students there. 
And so we don't have this big, robust view of the altar and the, the beautiful design. This chapel is kind of ugly. It's just kind of like a cement pyramid. But um, it pyramid or overturned ship with a very sharp uh, point. But it was designed for acoustics. And this took some great foresight so now they're sitting in the back of the sanctuary by the baptismal font still vested still praying the prayers of the church still reading through the readings of the church still singing through the hymnody of the church for the appropriate season still preaching the word of god the video and audio quality on this cannot be beat so i encourage you if you're looking for good solid lutheran content find me at 1517 films on facebook like subscribe all that fun stuff follow Oh, follow, it's follow for Facebook. Yeah, follow for Facebook. And uh, I'm, as soon as I see content that I think is good, I'm going to share it there on Facebook so that you can find it and you can be blessed by it as well. What a what a blessing. We, we feel like we're in some kind of barren wasteland and this precious gift of the sacrament has been taken away from us, but the word will never pass away, will never be taken away from us. And that is good, good news. That is good news for us. Now, this is certainly a blessing. And you heard me say in the beginning, is it going to end up being a curse? Maybe. I hope not. And I think I think more than just myself, I think pastors out there, you should be using this opportunity to prepare your congregations to come back to church. Because it's great sitting here at my kitchen table, my laptop, Traditionally right here where my you can see my beer is sitting. Drinking a cup of coffee, watching my pastor preach, singing the hymns, wearing pajama pants. It's great. I don't need to go to church anymore. We've heard this excuse before from people who never went to church. Now, miraculously, people are flooding to the church even though they can't physically go. But now but there's still that mindset. I don't have to go to church. Well, you don't have to go, Karen, but you, you one day you will get to. You will get to. And I think that's where this great blessing is going to be abused. Because if we're honest with ourselves, and we read the scriptures objectively, we'll see that God's good gifts are often abused for no other, in no other way than by human reason. The gifts and miracles of God are explained away and rationalized away because guess guess who our God is? Ourselves, our bellies, our, our, our hearts and our emotions. So while it's great to see a, an awakening in the Lutheran church of such wonderful prayer offices, these gifts, these treasures that the church has had for millennia, this rich, robust heritage that belongs to us, not just as Lutherans, but as Christians. It's wonderful to see this from Pastor Jordan Cooper, from Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. For, and, and if you find more, there's, there's names of church. Pastor Will Whedon, um, Redeemer Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. All of these phenomenal resources that as often as I see them, I'll be sharing to Facebook at 1517 films so you can share them as well and drop yours in uh as well let's let's share this let's let's not hoard this to ourselves these are gifts of god oh my goodness you know i didn't appreciate these gifts when i was in the concordia system when i was becoming lutheran we had daily chapel at nine o'clock in the morning i I did, was not disciplined to get up and go to matins in, in the early morning. Occasionally, a friend would drag me to Vespers or, or Complim, and I would tease them, oh, you Lutherans, you could chant the whole Bible, and then at the very end, you'd change your note and go, oh, man. You know, I didn't appreciate these gifts, and it took realizing how hollow mainline American evangelicalism has become to see the full value and the fullness and the robustness of these these little prayer offices. And these will sustain us. These are great gifts of God. 
They are full of his word, at least in the Lutheran tradition. They are almost verbatim direct quotes from Scripture. And these will sustain us. The Lord will sustain us by his word. But the Lord also will put an end to this. And we will go back to church. Hopefully with joy in our hearts. Hopefully, I hate to say it, but hopefully we hit that gas pedal hard and just rev the engine and race to church for no other reason than to rejoin the fellowship of believers and participate in the Lord's Supper once again. And we look forward to that with well, it's Lent. So we look forward to that the same way we look forward to Easter with repentant joy. So while maybe we're all hoping that we can be back in church on Easter Sunday, maybe the pastor's message between now and whenever we're our, we are back to church should be the same as the pastor's message at Easter Sunday. Um, Jesus is still risen. Uh, he always is risen from the dead, and this doesn't end. This is not just today. Come back again. As we participate in these daily prayer offices, these liturgies, these great treasures, and we do it online because we're, we're being good stewards to our neighbor and socially distancing ourselves, behaving not like we don't want to catch the virus, but behaving like we have it and, and we're trying to protect other people, in love and service to our neighbor, we wait with an joyful anticipation. And as we are under the, the scourge of a pestilence, with repentant joy. I can't stress this enough. There's not one people group. Pastor Roseboro did a really good, really good episode on fighting for the faith about this, a really in-depth Bible study on this. It is not just one group of people, not one kind of sinner, not one country on earth that has caused this, the whole of humanity, our fallen, wretched, sinful state has caused this judgment to come upon us. And that's what it is. Let's just call a spade a spade. So while we know that it will end and we will be back in church on Sunday, eventually we wait, but we are called to wait with repentant joy. We should well, if not literally, then figuratively cover ourselves in ashes and sackcloth and cower before the presence of the Lord in terror and repentance and confess our own sinfulness. I should fall to my knees and confess my shortcomings, how I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by the things that I do and the things that I don't do. This is my responsibility. I don't say, Lord, I'm, I'm from an evil nation. You know, the gays are this and that, and the Democrats are this and... No. No scapegoating. I, a poor, miserable sinner. I wish I could remember it in Latin. I want to say it's mea culpa. Is that it? By my fault. By my own fault. By my own most grievous fault. That's the confession that we make to God. And we repent... After we, we confess what we have done, we repent, and we beseech the Lord for his mercy. If you ever notice, prayers in the Old Testament are often addressed to not just God, not just Yahweh. They are addressed to the Lord who delivered your people from Egypt. God's acts are spoken back to him in prayer. So we as Christians, having made confession of our sin to the Lord, having repented of our sin to the Lord, boldly declare to the Lord, you, O Father, who saw fit in love to send your only begotten Son into our flesh and on the cross to bear our sin, to rise again and be our Savior, you, Jesus Christ, who were crucified, died, buried, and risen again from the dead for me. You, O Holy Spirit, who proceed from the Father and the Son, who proclaim the words of God. We should tell God what he does, who he is in Christ. Just as the people of the Old Testament always address the Lord as the one who delivered them from Egypt, we address the Lord, you who sent your Son to die for us. 
we beseech you for Christ's sake to have mercy upon us. Thank you for continuing to be gracious in spite of your judgment. Thank you for not withdrawing from us that great treasure, your word. Feed us, sustain us, lead us. Never take your word away from us. You are faithful. Thank you for your word. Give us hearts that are receptive. Break through with your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds to receive your word with joy. Thank you for matins. Thank you for vespers. Thank you for morning and evening prayer. Thank you for Compline. Thank you for responsive prayer one and two. Thank you for these great treasures, Lord. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son to always guide me to appreciate these great gifts. When you in your infinite mercy, O Lord, see fit to withdraw this plague that you have sent upon us, continue by your Holy Spirit to stir our hearts to love these treasures, to cherish these treasures, to always seek out that which you are now providing. Give us your word in all of the liturgies of your church and give us hearts that receive it and cherish it. I think that's a good prayer. Because the danger is, for, for me just as much as anybody else, I'm no better than anyone else, the danger is that we become complacent in this. We become accustomed to this. And we stop going to church, assuring our pastor that we're watching online. Yeah. As we're sitting in our pajamas, drinking coffee, getting up to get another cup of coffee when we really should be paying attention to the sermon or the word or singing a hymn with our children. Gosh, wouldn't that be awful, huh? If our children see us treating church like that. Fathers, now, I'm not excluding single mother homes. Mothers have a, a great, great vocation that they have be call, been called to. And in this sinful, broken world, sometimes they're called to that vocation alone. But by and large, it is us, fathers, us, men, we are called to teach this faith to our children. We are called to show them that this has value. Our posture, how we sit in church, how many times we check our phones in church, how many times we're at home and we get up for another cup of coffee, the fact that we're sitting there in our PJs, this teaches our children how to view the third commandment. <laughs> and I think this is the danger, and I hope that pastors address this with their congregations during this time, during this season, I don't know what to call it, during this judgment. Let's just call a spade a spade. I hope that pastors address this with their congregation. Do not become complacent. We are being judged, sinner and saint alike, unrepentant and repentant alike, we are being judged. When the judgment ends and we can come back to the altar, come back. And pastors, don't stop. Don't stop live streaming these beautiful prayer offices. The, the, the liturgy of the hours is, is incredible. I wish I could be a stay-at-home dad so that I can engage myself fully into the whole liturgy of the hours, praying all the prayer offices, but I can't. But now, now, in his infinite mercy, God has granted all of us the ability to pray the liturgy of the hours. And I hope and I pray that when this virus is contained, and it's just another illness that we're going to be vaccinated for, like the flu, that we would return to the Lord in joy, but we would keep this gift that we have been given to sustain us. Because, and we'll end it this way, the word of the Lord endures forever. It is a priceless treasure. And even in judgment, God in love for Christ's sake does not withhold his word or his Holy Spirit from us. He comes to us in word now for a time 
to sustain us until he comes to us in word and sacrament. And when he returns to us in word and sacrament, let us treasure the various forms of the word that he has come to us now. Let, let us challenge ourselves to return to church on Sunday and to keep the liturgy of the hours. I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade.